It's me, Red. Is everything okay? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, sure thing. Come on in. What? Who are you? I'm your grandma. Your face looks really weird, Granny. I've been sick, I... Uh, your mouth doesn't move when you talk. Uh, plastic surgery. Grandma's had a little work done. Now come on over here. Let's have a look at you. So, what's going on, Grandma? Ooh, this and that. Doing a lot of quilting, so you got the loot. Whoa. What big hands you have. Oh, all the better to scratch my back with. And what big ears you have. All the better to hear your many criticisms. Old people just have big ears, dear. And Granny, what big eyes you have. Are we just gonna sit around here and talk about how big I'm getting? You came here for a reason, didn't you? So tell old Granny what you got in the basket. Welcome to the Perfect Movie Podcast, the podcast where we answer the question, is this a perfect movie? I'm Kalen. I'm Michael. Today we're talking about Jin Ro. Movie from 1999. It is a anime, and uh, things happen in this movie. Uh, <laughs> Michael, what do you think of Jin Ro? Okay, so uh, at the beginning of this movie... I was pretty intrigued. Uh, it starts and we're in like a alt future Japan where the Nazis have won World War, World War II and the whole future is altered. And there seems to be some sort of revolution. There are riots in the street. There are these masked police force that is crushing these riots. And we meet a little girl, a little anime girl that speaks only by going, Ugh. <laughs> And I was like, man, these anime motherfuckers cannot help themselves, you know? <laughs> They're like, just always horny. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really worried that I was like, oh, this is a cool concept, but this it's our main character is going to be this little girl that just kind of grunts and moans her way through the entire story. Yep. And then about 20 minutes later, she blows herself up in a sewer with a suicide bomb. And I was like, sick. Shit's getting real. This is cool. And then... My some, interest kind of dove off a cliff. Some things happened. Uh, there's it, intrigue. There's a lot of people going like, I'm really a part of this organization. Yeah. <gasps> so we follow this centralized character. Um, his name is Fuse. And uh, he's a part of this uh, militant group. Uh, well, they're, they're a police force mm. that um, was created in order to, they're like an anti-terrorist organization. And so he's a part of this group, and he's the one that that murdered the girl at the beginning, or he was trying not to murder the girl. Um, he was pretty hesitant at first, and then she ended up getting blown up. Um, and so we follow in this character along. He's he's very conflicted uh, morally. He's not sure what allegiance he's to. He ends up kind of getting with the sister of this girl and uh, forming a relationship with her. And there's like a there's like a whole review board because after the incident, they're like. This guy, he didn't pull the trigger when he was supposed to. Yeah. And they had to sort of like answer for how everything went down in the sewers that night. They sent him back to basic training, trying to get him to uh, be reprogrammed again. Um, yeah, let's get into uh, performance test. It was the performance of a lifetime. The performance test where we talk about our favorite actors, characters, and moments. So it we we always kind of find it hard to uh to do performance tests during animation April. Uh really it's a character test. We we kind of uh uh pick out some key characters um and some of their key moments and uh I think honestly if anything the most compelling character is is Fuse. Um he he's 
just the uh, what is it? He's ambiguous as far as like his. It's kind of an anti-hero type of deal. Um, he doesn't really know what allegiance he he he's standing with, or he he's all for one cause. And then as time goes on, he's starting to see the flaws. And if if you haven't seen Jinro, uh, but you have seen Star Wars: The Force Awakens, uh, the his sort of the start of his arc is the same as the start of Finn's arc, where yes. he's part of like the evil organization, and he kind of takes a moment to be like. Am I really that guy? Yeah. But the difference here is that he remains that guy. Yeah. And I guess full spoilers for Jinro. Um, at the end, he's still very much a part of this organization. And um, yeah, his character is interesting. I, he was kind of flat for the most part. Not a whole lot going on. I think that's kind of main like most of the characters in this are yeah so like that so there's a romance in big air quotes in the middle of this movie and it and it's because both sides are playing each other yeah. uh the 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 alleged sister of the girl that blew up is actually working with like a counterintelligence group that is trying to shut down the uh i think they're trying to reform uh reform the the organization yeah they they want it instead of them being so militant and, and like literally brute force, they want them to be more intelligence based as yeah. far as how they handle the terrorism stuff. Uh, so she is, which we don't find out for 40 minutes is playing another side. And he is also like re- deep down, really a hardcore member of the, the special police. Um, but there's about 40 minutes in the middle of this movie, which is a lot of, uh, the like heads of the two various police forces are bickering about how things should be ran. Yeah. And then like quote unquote romance where like he just kind of sits there and acts stoic and the girl's like, well, don't you, don't you like spring? Spring is nice and the sun is shining and just does that like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that that kind of manic pixie dream girl thing, which kind of works for the twist. But She's also constantly quoting books like Little Red Riding Hood or different things like that. Well, yeah, and that ties into the fact that uh, our, our Fuse is a member of the Wolf Brigade, Wolf Br- Brigade, yeah. which is like a, a sect within the Special Police that's like rooting out the the less hardcore yeah. a from wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing, basically. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, Red Riding Hood comes up a couple times, <laughs> and a, a big Red Riding Hood quote at the end. Yeah. It was kind of hilarious, but. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as characters go, I think that's really like our main main two. Yeah, there is a special police guy, uh I'm forgetting his name, that is like kind of our third main character. He gets dispatched near the end and he's sort of playing both sides as well. Um if this sounds a little like a, we're skimming over it, I think it's just cuz uh we we both try this was a new movie for both of us. Yeah. And I think it just kind of hit like a dud. I was very excited for like the first like twenty minutes. Once that little girl blew up, I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, we're we're doing real adult animation." Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and then it just kind of saunters off into like I thought this movie was going to be more about like this rebel militia and this special police force and like them butting heads, but it becomes about this internal conflict between the police. And I'm like, that doesn't interest me much at all. Neither does this romance plot. So it should be noted that this film is a prequel. Um, apparently there's a few other films in the same universe that deals with the same types of things, um, that includes like the Wolf Brigade and different things like that. But this is the only film that's made, uh, that is animated. The rest of them are live action. Um, and so these, those are kind of older works from the nineties. And so I I guess people who have been following this series, uh, would be more accustomed to like the world and everything, but I felt completely kind of lost uh, for the most part. It, it's just kind of hard to follow, and then there's just so many slower bits that kind of uh, it just kind of all kind of meshes together, and it's a little confusing at times. I didn't really know what was going on. It didn't really pique my interest too much. So I will say the animation itself was cool when it started. I was like, wow, this is impressive. I haven't. You don't see a lot of like, I don't know. A lot of like big mobs and crowds and like the way the violence is done is pretty like intense. It's bodies are getting shredded up by machine guns frequently and it's yeah, it hits hard when it needs to. But then it kind of I feel like drops the bag as far as like character and connections. And I don't know. The intrigue wasn't that intriguing to me. So towards the end when it's like 
this person's actually a secret member of this organization, and this person's <laughs> a secret member of this organization, and I'm just kind of like, okay. So, I mean, I guess we could start talking about some more of the, the interesting aspects of this movie. Um, so let's move on to It's an Art. What's this? It's an art project. Okay, I like it. Picasso. <laughs> yeah, that way. It's an art is where we talk about our the artistic uh, parts of the movie, like particularly in this case, the animation and the soundtrack is what I would say would stand out in the sound design. Um, the animation is really, uh, it's not hyper detailed in the way a lot of mo- modern anime is, but I think yeah. it's good. It's a good art style. I think the detail comes from the backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and not as much the characters themselves. Uh, if you look at the backgrounds, like, I mean, it's just a war torn city. Um, and then there's moments of beauty. Uh, and there's like a scene where they're at like a, it's like a carnival or they're, they're overlooking something that has like a giant Ferris wheel. It's, it looks very nice. Um, some of the issues I had with the animation was once you get characters into full lighting, like, <clears throat> like broad day, uh, it looks very flat, but the scenes that are the most effective are like when they're in the sewers and it's really dark and you get all these shadows. The, just the whole design of the, the Wolf Brigade or the, um, the armored soldiers is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and it actually inspired a lot of different other media. Uh, I think kill zone is probably one of the biggest inspirations. Um, or Jinro is one of the biggest inspirations for kill zone. Um, I think Wolfenstein as well. There's a handful of others, anything that's kind of dealing with like fascist regime regimes and stuff and different, like, um, kind of, uh, alternative reality Mm -hmm. kind of deal. Those those alt future World War Two yeah uh, <clears throat> media properties, but I love the scene in the beginning when the uh, the Wolf Brigade is like revealed and they come out of the shadows and you just see their glowing red eyes. It was really effective, and uh, they're the way that these characters are handled. It's much like the alien and alien and from Alien. Um, it, it it's they're not shown too much, and I think that's good in a way to keep the scare factor for them effective Mm -hmm. yeah the the wolf brigade's design is really cool um and i thought the sound design of like when there when there are gunfights it's like really loud really intense and yeah like the sounds of people just like the the gory goopy like flesh getting ripped apart yeah uh that is really sort of the way this movie ends and be- begins and ends is some big, gory intensity. Um, and with the recitation of the Big Bad Wolf poem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really love the uh, the, <clears throat> the sound design of the machine guns from the, the Wolf Brigade. It's like a really... It, it's almost it's soft, but it's like a it's like a thump. It, mm-hmm. It's really hard to explain, and let, maybe you could throw a sound clip in. Um, but it's a really cool effect. Yeah, the animation is gorgeous. They they do a different. Well, this is all hand-drawn animation for the most part, I believe. Um, But they do kind of like, I guess you would call it mapping almost, where it's like they take, um, like the, this is kind of what old Disney used to do, where they would take video of somebody dancing or doing something like choreographed, and then they would draw over it. And uh, it works really well just to create the fluidity of these characters and make them more realized different things like that. So I noticed some of that and then just the cell shading and stuff. It's, it's gorgeous. Should we move along to, Hey, what are you trying to say? All right. I'll take that. So the suits, I have the shoes, maybe a nice hat, nice hat with a, well, a nice ribbon or a big handkerchief. What are you trying to say? (laughs) What are you trying to say? Oh, Hey, I'm a guy I can wear a hat. Huh? Oh, look at the tall freak. Probably can't fit a hat on that big, huge melon of his. Is that what you're saying? It's going to slip down over my head and down my little scrawny neck onto my shoulders, and I'll look like some cartoon character out of a Warner Brothers? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, actually, that's, that's what I was. Yeah, 
Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Fascism, bad. <laughs> People dressed like Nazis, bad. bad. <laughs> um, love, not in this world. <laughs> no. Um, the spoilers for Jinro. It's, I mean, it is very grim and dark because uh, towards the middle of the movie, we get the idea, the hope, I guess, that despite these two characters being from opposing forces, that the lady and uh, Fuse will are real lovers. And we get the impression that maybe that's true. And then we get the final twist that he's like, no, he's just, Fuse is just the right-hand man of like the head of the Wolf Brigade. And he's tasked with his final bit of cleanup to clean up the mess that is behind him is to murder his lover, I guess. Kind of, yeah. Uh, and she starts wailing and crying and go, oh my, what large teeth do you have? <laughs> oh my, <laughs> what, what big paws you have doing the whole Little Red Riding Hood returns home. <laughs> Mother, what big ears you have. Mother, what big eyes you have. Mother, what big claws you have. Mother, what big teeth you have! It was like no context, but just the audio. If you were to hear that, it would be kind of sexual. Yeah. It was, it was kind of strange. It was strange. But I, I attribute that to the dub. Uh-huh. Maybe it just it's like a error in translation kind of thing, or it is lost in translation. Oh, I listened to, I watched the sub. Oh, you and did? That is literally what she's saying. Is okay. What large teeth do you have? What okay. She's reciting Red Riding Hood. I mean, I guess it's if you topical. Watch the, if you watch the dub, it, it sounds very bizarre and doesn't really work. But. It's topical. Yeah. He pops her once right in the dome, and then I think credits roll. Yeah. So, yeah. certified bad time. Which is, uh, I mean, it's in, long, in line with what we watched last week. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I chose this. Uh, this was something that, I, this is an anime that it, it has been overlooked. I, I know it's kind of gained a, a cult following. Mm-hmm. There was actually a live action remake of this by a Korean uh, film studio. And I don't think it did very well. But that's always like the case when people try to make uh, anime into live action. It just never really translates for, too well. Um, I, I think there's, well, I guess we could just move into let the hate flow through. Um, good. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. (laughs) Unless do you have anything else to say? I do not. Okay. Um, I, I think there, there are a lot more animes that have done this dystopia, type of thing better Uh, i'm thinking like akira i don't think you've seen akira i've seen like no anime so if you name an anime i haven't seen it um and then ghost in the shell which is uh that's like a huge anime movie from the either late 80s or the 90s um and it's actually made by the same studio they made uh general but i think that there's just a lot of anime films that do this dystopia dystopian reality a lot better and it's a lot more fleshed out Mm -hmm. Um, you care more about the characters that kind of thing Um, but I think for the most part this movie it's a solid movie if you if you like anime and if you love like 90s animation uh, this is kind of right up your alley Um, it's definitely has that nice like 90s animation feel to it it's it's very dark it's very very grim Um, if you're into that kind of thing I'd say definitely check it out but this one didn't really do it for me I had a hard time watching this same and i don't think it's just like even being like low octane in the middle or being japanese because recently i watched this movie called a uh, harakiri which is a i think is the highest rating film on letterboxd it's like a japanese samurai film from i think like the late 50s and but in it, a lot of that movie is a guy like this samurai settlement and being like I'm going to commit harakiri, which is when you slice your belly open Simple for goal. suicide. Yeah. Um, but he's like, first, I want to tell you this story. And you kind of find out that he's on a revenge quest on the behalf of his son. 
And it's a lot of dudes sitting cross-legged just talking at each other. Um, but I found it more intriguing strictly, I think, because it's personal. This movie is procedural, and I find it weirdly procedural. I find it weird. It just feels like we focused on the wrong thing. I would have been interested in this movie if it was The Rebels and The Wolf Brigade, you know? Like, yeah. Like, and that you is, still have that moral ambiguity, too. You know, yeah. what I mean? with the character of Fuse. I mean, they call the the rebels terrorists, and like, of course, the government wouldn't anybody that's trying to overthrow them. But also, like, you know, they are putting citizens' lives at risk, not just, uh, you know, the the lives of the police. So, but then the, it would just be Star Wars, Michael. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I just wanted. I just wanted. I was just really disappointed when it started becoming this internal police dilemma. I'm like, I yeah. don't care about any of these people. They all suck, from what I can tell. Yeah, they can all die. And they're not like entertaining in any like particular way. Like this right. doesn't have like the I don't know like wild characters that even like I've seen in like uh, not Howl's Moving Castle, but Spirited Away. Spirited Away, yeah. You know where there's at least like some like characters that are like big and and kinda... it kept it kept you invested. Yeah, like even this... though you were iffy about that too. But... Yeah, this is just like. Just barking up the wrong tree, mostly, in my yeah. opinion. There's some cool stuff in it. I do think the beginning and end are cool, but then it's like 45 to 50 minutes of like, I don't know if I care much about this. And it w- holds on, I think, way too long to be like, actually, this guy's on this side and she's on this side. Yeah. And it maybe would have been more intriguing if we saw them both have these ulterior motives. Like the audience knows, but they don't know. And we watch them interplay through that. Right. But we don't know that until it's revealed later. I just feel like it was missing some intrigue and interest. And I was just overall. For sure. Kind of checking out. That samurai movie you mentioned, was that the first like samurai movie to ever do the blood spurt? Uh, I have no idea. Was there a blood spurt in that film? Um, I'm trying to think. There's only like one big duel at the end, and I don't remember it being particularly bloody. There's definitely kind of bloody, like, so at the beginning, this guy's son shows up, and they make him, and he says he wants to commit Harakiri, and they're really like, because they're all about their honor, they kind of say, at first, he he asks for a day, right right before he's going to actually do it, and they say, no, you need to go through with it. And they didn't give him a replacement sword. He had a wooden samurai sword that they made him commit himself with. So he's like slicing himself across the belly with a dull sword. And it's like really bloody and painful looking. And so there's certainly gore, but I don't know about the only reason I ask is because I know there's a samurai film, I I think possibly from the fifties that the, the reason, so you remember, you know, like, um, kill bill, you know how, when she slices people, there's a big blood spray. Yeah. So in that film, um, <clears throat> they accidentally punctured the bag, like the blood bag, a certain way when they were filming it, and mm-hmm. it spurted out like that. And that was by complete accident. And then that was like the dawn of like <clears throat> the blood spray that you see in all these samurai films and stuff. So that's pretty interesting. But I, I thought that was the movie that you're. Referring no, to. I mean this movie's pretty lacking in combat. If you watch, it, if you look at any like stills of it, it's above that last fight, but it's not. <clears throat> A movie based around that really this isn't like seven samurai or okay okay one of the more like real like ninja a- like samurai action okay movies it's a real like these are our honor code and morals what are yours <sighs> okay type of okay. movie it was interesting but cool more interesting than jinro shall, <laughs> <laughs> shall we uh ask our final question let's do it is this a perfect movie you lost a baby brother Perfect in every way. I had a baby brother! I had a little baby brother! And he was perfect! Perfect in every way! No. Nope. No. I, I wasn't expecting this to be, but I, I was, like you were saying, I was expecting this to be a lot more interesting. Um, <clears throat> just because everything that I've seen regarding this film, people are calling it a masterpiece. People are calling it like the most overlooked anime of all time, that kind of thing. Um, so I was really excited to kind of check this out. And because uh, I'm a big fan of anime, I'm a big fan of the 90s stuff. Um, it was just like the golden era of animation back then. Everything was brilliant. 
Um, not everything, but a lot of things were brilliant. Um, so yeah, I was kind of disappointed by this. Uh, who knows? Maybe again, I'll, I'll watch it sometime and see if there's something I missed or if it hits me a different way. But it just didn't do it for me. Uh, yeah, I agree. Not a uh, massively entertaining movie, um, and not one that it 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 has valid and credible. It has some like credible, valid things to it, but it is not one that captured me. So, not a perfect movie. And since this was kind of a dud, uh, we were thinking we would just maybe talk about some recent movies and films that we've watched. Uh, TV shows? TV shows. Uh, Freaking, if you read a cool book and you want to talk to me. <laughs> I need to, did you do anything cool recently besides get drunk the other night? I mean, that was, I don't know if that was cool. <laughs> uh, I got jury duty coming up. That's cool. So I'm excited gonna put somebody away <laughs> i'm looking forward to flexing the strong arm of the justice <laughs> division of our government no i don't i don't have anything as cool as jury duty uh going on i can't remember the last time i did a thing that i would say that was cool that i did that not in a while well did you watch any cool movies um i did i went and i saw a monkey band in theaters Starring Dev Patel. You've probably seen commercial for Monkey Man. If you haven't, it's kind of taglined as uh, Indian John Wick. I would not simplify it that much. It is definitely an action revenge movie. um, But it is much different than John Wick in the fact that I think this movie is really front loaded with the reason for the revenge. John Wick is searching for an excuse for the revenge. You know, it's kind of a meme. John Wick's dog dies. And then he has a rampage for the next like 10 hours of cinema. This movie is all about like getting you to hate these three individuals in particular and why this man needs to murder them and uh, getting you on board with him. Yeah. And then his first attempt, they, it's just an absolute botch. <laughs> <laughs> Total botch job. I was wondering, uh, this or I think is like Mission Impossible Fallout as far as like bathroom fights I've seen recently. Oh, yeah. Pretty great bathroom fight. Yeah. I, the, this movie, um, so I watched... One particular review of this movie, and I think this is a criticism I've seen a few times. You've seen Monkey Man. Yes. Did you find that some people called it shaky cam in the fighting? And I don't think it was shaky cam. There were <clears throat> moments that did, were a little like unfocused with the camera, but there was also a lot of cool uh, like movements with the camera and also like ways of shooting fights. Like we went into like first person perspective sometimes. That was awesome. And they didn't utilize that as much as I wish they did. But when they did show that for that brief second, I was like, that's sick. I've never seen that before. And it usually wasn't him doing something cool. It was him getting obliterated. It was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was our main character getting pummeled in the face in first person. I, yeah, I wouldn't say shaky cam. I, I definitely think there was a lot more cuts than you would see in like John Wick. But I attribute that to the choreography, which is just like maybe they just didn't have, you know, it's not John Wick level choreography it's not uh so, what is it chad stileski a lifetime stuntman directing this movie it's dev patel an actor right right so uh there i don't think it's lacking in stunts like, like i think the few fights that there are are pretty cool but um it is not a yeah like there is more action with the camera although sometimes i liked how the camera like there's a one one part where there's like a, a mob assembling and like the the cameras just go in like buck wild and it yeah. just gives you that like because it's in like an unnamed town in india that's very overpopulated and it just gives you that claustrophobic like there's too many people everywhere and they're all angry right now yeah. i mean but you can also i mean from the perspective of the main character it's very manic and i think that's a way to like describe his character yeah he he's kind of a psychopath i mean it just the decisions he makes, it's not something a rational human being would do. So it's just like you're kind of like in his mind a little bit and you're just seeing he's just seeing red the entire movie because <clears throat> he's just so full of rage. And I just I think that translates re- very well to the style of like filming that they did. I mean, it's literally. Uh, my name is Nico Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare, Prepare to, to die. die. <laughs> yeah. And there's nothing else to it. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like if he was the main character of Princess Bride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's nobody's ever said that before. So you're the first one. Um, 
I think it's pretty fun. It's pretty great. I love the Indian flavor to it. It's worth watching. It's available for rental or streaming. The best thing about this movie is the setting. Yeah. It, it works so well. It's like I was telling you. It's like a. It's a neo, like styled India and that's something we haven't really seen before where it's like a, a disgusting city uh, a disgusting like foreign city basically that's not based in America but it's covered in neon lights and it looks amazing and I just I love that setting so much um, I like that uh, after he gets his ass beat we kind of like a journey of the mind and soul yeah for like 30 yeah. minutes as he gets taken into this temple and it gets weird. It gets really weird. And I wish they would have kept going with that weirdness. He, he takes some weird drugs. And the one line I wrote down from the whole movie is when he, uh, the like shaman man, the shaman person uh, hands the drug over. He says, the pain will leave you when it's done teaching you. And then just tells him to hit it. So like, yeah. that's kind of like the theme of the whole movie. Like he's in pain because he's revenging his dead mother and like the village that was destroyed when he was a child. Yeah. And uh the ending no spoilers because it's pretty new uh might be setting up for a sequel possibly yeah. and the one if thing it does I, well enough yeah the one criticism i have is i i kind of wished that the uh the monkey man i thought he was gonna be like it was gonna be like the ending of andor where like monkey man is a symbol of the revolution yeah and he, that he's bringing down the political system from you know by you know bringing out the head of the president and yeah throwing it on the ground it's not that. It stays personal, which is fine. Maybe that's going to be in the sequel, but it seemed like a movie, and I've heard some stuff in interviews, that this seems like a longer movie that was cut down, and I wonder if that's the part that they kind of tried to like fold mm. in and bring it down yeah, uh, and just focus on the personal. It's funny because I thought they were going to go the more supernatural route, <clears throat> and I almost wish they did that, just because you're, set you're setting up these like, shaman-esque stuff, and this guy is like... Uh, they they're kind of treating him like he's some kind of chosen one mm -hmm. kind of deal and it it's like he i thought he was like a god in human form kind of thing when i i kind of wish they kept going that route um, yeah cuz the movie opens with the i'm forgetting the name of the the monkey but the it's the monkey that reaches for the sun thinks it's yeah. a juicy mango and takes it and the gods get mad at him and like put him through hell right right um yeah, I mean it was still it's still a great film. I think you should definitely check it out if you love John Wick style movies. We're we're just getting so many of these now where it's like John Wick has done uh incredible thing for the industry, I guess. And I think it 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 services well sometimes where it's like I, I'm glad that we're getting better fight scenes in action films. Um that's awesome. I, I want more of that cuz I just it's a tribute to the work that people put in for these films, but um sometimes it can get a little muddled. <laughs> For sure. Last thing I'm going to say is whenever Shalto Copley shows up as like a side character, he's kind of disappeared since District 9. He's had a few uh, small bits, but his bit as the wrestling ring announcer and like Booker, I just it was like the perfect casting for yeah. him. He's a lot of fun in it. See, I wish he took the role that the short guy did had. I wish he was that character. His like wingman kind yeah. of. <clears throat> I think that would have been a lot more entertaining. He's just such an entertaining character. Yeah. I love his when uh, Monkey Man returns to the arena. I love the way he introduces him. He's like, I, I daughtered him straight from me, Mother Africa. He yeah. took him here. <laughs> yeah, he's it's great. He's awesome. Underrated actor for sure. Um, I watched The Beekeeper the other night. Speaking of action, uh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was it was fucking awful. Choice and Stoith. Um, my is review. <laughs> the Beekeeper. The Beekeeper. Um. <laughs> My review on Letterboxd was Jason Statham kills Crypto Bros, and that was basically it. Um, it there's no substance to this film. Uh, it opens up with a, a Jason Statham living on a, a, a he, he's living on a farm with yes. like, she allowed him to stay and keep his bees on this farm. Uh, the actress for this old lady that lives on the farm it was in the um, was in the uh, oh my god was she. It was Fresh Prince of Bel Air a long time ago. She was Aunt Vivian, mm. um, the light skin Aunt, Aunt Vivian, uh, the one that got recast. Um, and so she, I guess she's online and she's gets like a scam email or something, and she clicks it, and uh, she something's wrong with her computer. It freezes up, so she calls up this like IT company that 
puts gives her a link or something and she calls them and these guys are scammers and it cuts to like this um this uh this tech room where these a bunch of crypto bros are vaping and they're just being assholes and they're like it, it's a really bad impression of um of the wolf of wall street um uh jordan belfort uh, the yeah. main like bad guy and he uh he's going on this whole spiel about how oh i can help you out and then he's but at the same time he's like coaching his staff on how to scam people and so they end up taking it like two million two million dollars out of this lady's account and then she like it's like what the fuck and they ghost her and she kills herself <laughs> and then so jason statham and this girl's this woman's daughter go on like this revenge quest against these crypto guys and it's awful. So don't watch it. It's not good. Is the action cool? And, I mean, it's like your typical Jason Statham stuff. It's just like one guy against a thousand people. It's just, just like endless headshots. Yeah, pretty much in that. And it's like, you know, he's just beating the shit out of anybody and anything. And it's just not fun. Does, does he have a good fun speech at the end where he tells them to not be bad guys? No more? He says that during the part so he he finds in the beginning of the film he finds this one um the 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 headquarters of this or one of the headquarters of this these crypto bros and he goes up there with some gas cans and he's like i'm gonna light all this shit on fire i'm gonna burn this fucking place to the ground if you guys don't start taking advantage of the elderly that's like literally what he says and then uh <clears throat> starts fighting people and burning shit and it was fine and uh yeah uh, speaking of movies with fights in it, I watched the Roadhouse reboot with Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh God, three action movies back to back. Um, it's not very good. It does this thing. So some of the fighting is interesting because it does like have this like kind of behind the shoulder uh, perspective, and that kind of really puts you in it. Um, but then they would also do these like CGI edits where like the worst one is. And this isn't a fight scene, but uh, Jake G is walking home and then like the camera's in front of him. And then all of a sudden, like, boom, out of the corner comes a truck that looks so fake that knocks him like off the bridge into the water. <laughs> and like they'll they'll be like, oh, one positive of this movie, Jake Gyllenhaal uh, scares Post Malone at the beginning of this movie. Oh, he does. Beats the shit out of Post Malone. Oh, my God. So there's, you know, something we've all wanted. <laughs> <laughs> some catharsis there um and then like there'll be fights and they'll like toss a guy overhead but like you can see mid through the toss that his body is transformed into a cgi body when it goes and oh, flying no. through the window and stuff and it's just kind of iffy and i'm i hope this i don't think this will be a trend unlike because this is a doug lyman movie who did the born movies mm. and he ruined action movies for like 10 years because shaky cam was the thing yeah if this type of editing and the fighting becomes a thing i'll be very mad i don't think that'll be that case because i don't think that people are that jazzed about the roadhouse reboot i think mo it's pretty unanimous that everybody thinks it's terrible um and you and uh you and mcgregor shows or no conor mcgregor sorry totally yeah. different <laughs> oh yeah let's let's separate those two real quick <laughs> totally different vibe conor mcgregor shows up and he's just like bow-legged walking around being like i'll fuck your wife i like, heard he's <laughs> god awful in this i mean at least he's got some risk like he's he's <laughs> you know like he's just spicing it up it's not like the whole thing is pretty like stupid um, it's just Jake Gyllenhaal with his shirt off most of the time, right? Yeah, and he's like the first group of guy he beats up. He's like, "Do you uh, look? Do you have good health insurance? Because you're gonna need it, oh, and Jesus. stuff like that." Like it's, it, I don't know. It's a little tongue in cheek. It, it. I rated it two stars on Letterboxd. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but it was like, this is not like. <laughs> if this wasn't free for me to watch right now, I might be a little annoyed. Yeah. Yeah, you know, well, not technically free, but I don't pay for my prime membership. I'm, you know, bumming off that one. Um, I guess I could talk about a TV show. I watched the Fallout series. Uh, it all eight episodes are on Amazon Prime. If you are into, speaking of Amazon Prime content, oh my God, Amazon Prime has just been rolling out bangers. Um, Fallout was good. I know you watched the first episode or didn't even get all the way through it and you turned it off or? i watched the pilot and i was like i don't need to watch any more of this oh, okay and that's fair um we're, we're both i guess we're fans of the game 
say? It kind of made me want to go restart a Fallout game. I haven't, but it kind of made me want to do that. Yeah, same. I don't know if this gets better. I just want to air on my complaint about Fallout. And in my mind, I feel like Amazon has decided that one of their like house styles is being the boys. Mm-hmm. And the beginning of this has that kind of wackiness that the boys has. I felt like, and I feel like there's a lot of adjectives I would use to describe Fallout before I got to wacky. It can be wacky, but it just didn't feel like this is it's just like it has all the things. A guy takes jet. Everybody's got pit boys. They're wearing the uniforms. There's the 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 Brotherhood of Steel. Like all the things are there, but I was like, this is not my Fallout. But I, because I don't remember Fallout having like the cynicism, like the, like. I, mean, I don't know. It does. does it though? I mean, I don't remember that though. Maybe because I, I didn't really care for the story. I was kind of always fucking around in Fallout, so I don't know. I mean, obviously there was some like with the '50s stuff, you know, and like the, uh, um, the nuclear family shit, or just preparing for the apo- the inevitable apocalypse kind of stuff. Obviously, that's like parody, but I'd never really noticed that. But there's a lot of that in this. And uh, because I mean, you're there. We're following the character of a of a of a of a vault dweller, and so you really get to see the lives of like your everyday vault people, and Mm -hmm. they're just so cut off from the outside world that they think that they're the last people on earth, and so inevitably she finds out that's very much not true, and that they aren't this these saviors that are supposed to arise out of the ground and lead everybody into a new world kind of thing. Um, so I like that aspect. I thought that was pretty interesting. I thought they nailed the look of Fallout. I thought it it, it definitely had that vibe, and everything was looked correct. And too many pretty people. Yeah, I needed more ugly people. People were hideous. If you've ever played a Fallout game, they're disgusting. I, that was my one complaint. I'm like, so many more of these people should be really ugly. Well, because in the first episode, do we get to the town? No, we are just in the Okay, you got to wait for that then. Okay. Because you do get some uggos, for sure. And you get some people who are, like, fucked up off that, then you know, the radiation stuff. And people, there's, like, this doctor character that, um, there's a line where he's, like, apparently he was fucking some farmer's chickens. Something really awful and disgusting. But he's, like, um, he's, like, this, uh, self, um, made doctor and he he has all these awful like tonics and stuff that he gives to people for a couple caps or whatever and then it ends up like rotting people's feet or doing something crazy like that you know it's some little interesting touches and it kind of fleshes out the world because these are characters you would run into Mm -hmm. in the game you know so not that it's like a brand new or super unique thing but isn't uh the plot of fallout 4 just go find daddy and so is the plot of the Fallout. Fallout. Fallout 3 is that too. Yeah? Yeah. No, Fallout 4 is go find son. And then you run into daddy. Is this true? Yes. It's probably true. Fallout 3 is you're trying to find dad who is Liam Neeson. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then New Vegas is its own thing. That's what I needed was uh, the beginning to be her as a baby. In, in first person view. <laughs> yeah. As yeah. you run around. <laughs> you learn how to turn your head. <laughs> Look up. Look down. Well, there's like gross creatures. They do the ghouls that are like really great. Um, the Brotherhood of Steel is pretty cool. Um, there's this character called Maximus who is like this guy who he's really devoted to the Brotherhood of Steel. Uh, he'll do anything to get some type of uh, notoriety. And he finally get he really wants to wear power armor. And eventually he stumbles across an opportunity to wear po- power armor. And, of course, he takes it. Because didn't we all do that in Fallout? Of course. Yeah. He's like your typical character that just kind of joins any faction they run across. And uh, that's great. And then there's a line from the ghoul character who is played by a guy from... Uh, uh, Timothy Oliphant? Yeah. he. We know him from Hateful Eight. No, that's wrong. <clears throat> now I'm going to have to look this up. Timothy Oliphant is the guy from Justified. Not Walton Goggins. Walton Goggins. Yeah, he's great. He's a great actor. Um, but he plays like this cowboy who uh over time turns into a ghoul during the apocalypse 
and uh, he's got some great lines. There's this line where he's like, rule number one about the wasteland, you're always going to get sidetracked by stupid shit. <laughs> and that's just such, that just perfectly explains Fallout. And uh, yeah, I, I liked it for the most part. I, I know they're going to milk the fuck out of the series. The ending, spoilers, just skip ahead for this part, but they're setting up New Vegas. So that might be interesting. Hmm. Um, we'll see. But I, I think my like cynical side comes out when I see these because um, everybody saw The Last of Us. Everybody um, saw what that did for the industry. And they're like, let's all make video game adapta- adaptations now. And they're just going to milk the fuck out of everything. There's like a new Sonic yeah. Spin off Knuckles for whatever fucking reason. I don't know, but Idris Alba plays Knuckles, and I guess it's a thing. People think it's great. Uh, there was like Twisted Metal that came out recently. Yeah. Um, I think they're making a God of War show. Twisted Metal is funny because that's not a brand that anyone's been interested in for a long time. For like almost 30 years. Since like now, the PlayStation probably. 2. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like I was saying, God of War is coming out soon. They're they're doing a lot. Uh, Last of Us season two, so I don't know if if they make them competently, I'm fine with it. That they still can't do justice to Halo. Halo season two came out and it's shit still. Um, I don't know why they keep getting Halo so wrong. It's the, it's wrong, the easiest fucking thing. It's the wrong company. It's the CBS, Viacom, Paramount Corporation. Paramount stuff, they yeah. are not. Uh, equipped for it they don't really do prestige television everybody's pissed television. because master chief has his helmet off the entire time and it's like like you're just trying to make people mad at that point like i don't know um did you notice who was the cameo that uh awoke in walton goggins from his sleep no fried shrimp garlic shrimp. oh uh yeah bubba gump bubba gump <laughs> yeah that's that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, Bubba. Yeah. Now I just see him as the uh, <clears throat> the guy from Fences. Oh, yeah. okay. <clears throat> the special boy from Fences. Yeah, special boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, another new release I watched recently was Hundreds of Beavers, which is a weird one. It's a silent film, like live action Looney Tunes, basically. Where a a man is sabotaged by beavers. He's an ale maker and uh, he crashes. He wakes up. It's the winter. And he has none of the stuff that he had before. And he has to survive. And um, it's almost like a video game where he just keeps getting better like he's trying to trap. First he sees rabbits because he's getting hungry and he's trying to trap these rabbits. So the first thing he does is make a snowman that looks like a lady rabbit so it's just a rabbit with breasts and and tries to attract the rabbits that way and the rabbits are like checking out the the rabbit with breasts the snowman rabbit some looney tunes that shit it's literally like the first half is just like an elmer fudd versus bugs bunny that's pretty fun and then it expands there's like a there's a salesman that trades pelts and (laughs) above him it has like the price of each thing so you know when he goes back out like what he's shooting for because he'll bring back like two pelts and i'm like oh the two pelts that'll get you a knife or the (laughs) yeah all the way to the end which is like so many pelts or it's the the title line of the movie uh the final thing on his like for sale board is he has a daughter and the the icon is a ring so he's selling his daughter off for marriage Mm. and he's like what do it's a silent movie but this is the few times that they have like the word title cards. And he's like, what do I need to do to, you know, have a chance with your daughter? Cause this guy really doesn't like this buffoon. And he's like, you need to bring me hundreds of beavers. (laughs) 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 And then it's just like a montage of him figuring out. And also in the background, like there's all these various wildlife and in the background, the beavers are like, constructing something massive they have like a crane they're they have like a whole like society they're clearly the smartest they're smarter than the people in this world yeah and they're all working together and this is all live action so all the animals for the most part there's a few puppets and then there's people in like really silly like cheap like mascot type animal suits running around yeah very goofy very funny it's maybe like 15 minutes too long but it's i the one thing is like i feel like this is not an easy movie to edit down because it's a movie that's constantly building on its own bits, mm. you know? So, like, you, you lose something when you cut something out. 
because it's always playing on your expectations or like one of the bits is whenever he whistles this like blue jay will come peck on his face and he keeps doing it when he sees the eggs that look really good so he like, falls out <laughs> the tree and he pecks yeah. on his face and then like an hour later towards the end during when something really important is about to happen he does the whistle again and the the blue jay flies in who's the director again um not a famous director this was like a super low budget his name is mike cheslick i think he's done another movie similar to this because there's a lot of like green screen but there's also a lot of him marching around like an empty like snowy lake okay um it's super low budget and like made on the cheap you can tell but it's like pretty pretty endearing i liked it a lot all right well uh, i think we have some movies that we're like looking forward to coming up um furiosa think coming out in a few weeks that looks pretty awesome george miller again for another mad max type of film and uh we're we're looking forward to that probably going to go see that and possibly have a review for it um i know i'm looking forward to uh kingdom of the planet of the apes these fucking uh titles of these planet of the apes (laughs) movies are terrible um but it looks interesting it's a uh set after the events of the the planet apes trilogy that was made by matt reeves um, look forward to that. I think that comes out May 10th. So that should be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Kalen's big Planet of the Apes guy. I have seen all those movies and I tell you every time, like I watch them and then I forget which one was which yeah. and what happened. I remember liking them all, but I don't remember them at all. It's a, those are solid, solid trilogies. Um, those movies are great. Um, and they're kind of like under the radar as far as like trilogies go. But I think it's on the, side of like some of the better sci-fi out there um yeah so possibly have a review for that too we'll see about that one um do you want to tell everybody what we're doing next month so in may we will be doing marty may as in martin scorsese kale's favorite filmmaker oh my god congrats kalen just a belated birthday gift just for you thanks thanks um so Next up, we will be doing a Taxi Driver, and then we're going to be kind of going through Martin Scorsese's career decade by decade. So we're choosing a film from each of the next six decades, excluding the 2020s, because the only movie is uh, Killers of the Flower Moon uh, in the 2020s. And just making our way through it, seeing what we think of one of the, what a lot of people would say is the greatest filmmaker alive. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. So. Hey, you ever seen a film called Goodfellas? Hey, have you ever seen a movie called The Departed? That Departed sucks. Yeah, but people like that one. That's the one. Can you believe that's the movie of all his movies that he won the Academy Award for Best Picture? That's insane to me. It's like his 12th best movie. Literally, though, it's like it's not special. <laughs> it's not that good at all. And I just can't take Mark Wahlberg serious in any role ever. No, no. I mean, he was fine. He barely had he didn't have that many parts Mm-mm. in the in the film. Oh, he's third billing behind Matt Damon and Leo <laughs> and probably fourth even behind Jack Nicholson. Wolf of Wall Street. I, I really like Wolf of Wall Street a lot. We're not doing that one, but that's that's a great one. Um I'm trying to think, how many movies did he have Leo in? Four. Uh, Wolf. The Departed, uh, Gangs of New York, and uh, Shutter Island. Yeah. Aviator. Oh, five. Oh, my God. Everybody loves Leo. Are you sick of Leo yet? No, I love Leo. I- I'm sorry. I know you have your issues with him, but he he's competent. Oh. He- he's a good actor. I appreciate it. He wouldn't date me because I'm too old. (laughs) He would date me. (laughs) (laughs) All right. uh, You got anything else? Uh, Keep on rocking in the free world. And I'm not going to actually do that one. Um, (laughs) Let me see. Do I have any good messages, any knowledge to drop on anyone? Stay out the streets. You know what my real knowledge is as far as like movies and entertainment? If you don't uh, have Tubi downloaded, Tubi rocks, and it's free. Tubi does have some like classics on there. They have some like classic horror films. They got a they got a pretty wide selection, and they're 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 too bad. It's like a two three minute 
Yeah, break. I think they do the avocados from Mexico ad. That's like a banger. Avocados from Mexico. I probably can't say that on here. Am I good? You can't say where the avocados are from? Well, no, but I can't do their, their like their tag, their jinx. Get censored, like take it down. Yeah. I'm going to get the <laughs> avocado board. It's going to bring this down. All right. Well, animation, April, over. Marty May continues. I don't think this was a very good animation, April. Unfolds. Um, I think we definitely went out on a bum note. Yeah. Is what happened. Yeah. Because last year we ended on Into the Spider-Verse, didn't we? Or something like that. We ended on a banger last year. I don't recall. I was watching Rango the other night. We should have done Rango. Rango is good. Rango is really good. Johnny Depp, yeah. And lizards and this is pre Amber Heard. You Johnny know, you Depp. know who directs that? Who? Gore Verbinski, the director oh. of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Oh my God! Jack Sparrow is in the fucking Rango movie. We love Jack Sparrow. Hey. Also, I watched Gladiator, and the Gladiator theme and the Pirates theme are like the same song. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just watched like all of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies recently. Those movies are great. The first three are good. Those are solid movies. The first one I can say was definitely good. I haven't returned to them Dude, since I was like a teenager. They're so much fun. And like the world is fleshed out and the characters are gross and disgusting. Everybody's missing teeth and drinking fucking rum i feel like the third one is the one where i'm like i don't know if this is good the third one's like three hours long that's the one where it it kind of went down the route of like okay we're starting to get a little ridiculous we're getting a little there's just too much going on yeah um it was like the force awakens of pirates movies the second movie had the fucking kraken and shit it was awesome those are great movies um i don't understand why those are so like polarizing to people I don't know. I think it's the Johnny Depp of it all. You're either on board with Johnny Depp as that thing and think think it's entertaining. And they kind of like really beat the dead horse through the next. There's like two more sequels after that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I didn't even think Johnny Depp was like the best aspect. I thought the best aspect was all the, the side characters and the fucking uh, the extras. Everybody just like looked like they're having so much fun doing this. Yeah. Like the so. skinny guy and the guy with the glass. Eye. Yeah, they're great. Or wait, the skinny guy is the guy with the glass. eye. It's the skinny guy and the bald and guy. And the bald guy. No, yeah. he's not. Well, he's balding, but he's I mean, yeah, he's both got, disgusting. Pirates. He's got a long flowing crown of hair. Yes. Yes. They're both equally disgusting. Yeah. But yeah, the, those movies are great. Check those out. Yeah. <laughs> Name a movie with worse teeth. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's Killers of the Flower Moon. Is there really bad teeth in there? I mean, I think yeah, they had they do have bad. Leo teeth has bad teeth, but it's not pirates bad. Pirates bad. Is pirates like, bad is like it's up there. Everybody's teeth are brown and rotted. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a hard question. No, we don't actually have to do that. I was just. <laughs> I, I literally like am interested. In <laughs> what other movies have do have people just have terrible the worst teeth? Teeth. I feel like like Les Misérables maybe maybe like a uh, French Revolution. Everybody was dirty some sort of revolutionary war movie maybe like the patriot or something like that i don't remember that's a great question we should come up with a list mad max mad max more people are missing teeth than anything i think i don't know if that counts as like well i guess it could your your oral hygiene is just not there uh the family in um texas chainsaw massacre oh yeah not big on hygiene they're inbred so that was like a uh, any British movie. <laughs> <laughs> Just anything on the BBC. Do you think the Amish have bad teeth? No, I imagine... What else are they going to do with their time? They always look well-groomed. They do. There's like not a hair out of place. Yeah, everything's like really... I was going to say tight. That doesn't sound good. But everything's really like... Yeah, like you are saying. It's just... It's right where it needs to be. <sighs> Okay, should we, get, should we end this now? Yes. All right, I've dragged it along long enough. I I like you thinking we're going to end the podcast, and then I just... <laughs> and just keeps going. And I just keep going for like eight to ten more minutes. Because then you get me like interested in these little side <laughs> talks. Like, I just want to keep it on. But this isn't the Joe Rogan experience. I'm guys, the so. Martin Scorsese of podcasting. You think the podcast is going to end, but no, there's a whole like fourth section. <laughs> there's, there's a whole, there's 30 minutes left, guys. Yeah. <laughs> 
it was just for just getting you guys ready for Marty May. Where you're gonna? Oh my God, we have to get ready for Marty May. Do you know how much time we're gonna have to sit watching these fucking movies? Well, the, our first two are short. Taxi Driver and King Comedy, both under two hours. It's when we start getting into the Goodfellas stuff. Goodfellas, Gangs of New York, uh, Silence are all gonna be pushing three hours. Shutter Island. Shutter Island this is, is a. I think it's a normal motion yeah, like picture. Like a 15, yeah. 220 yeah. type of movie. So. Mark Ruffalo is in that. He is. Yeah. He's the most regular fucker ever. You know what I'm saying? There's like nothing like exciting about him. Although he was really good in that movie with Emma Stone. I watched that. That's what the one I should have talked about. Oh, Poor Things? Yeah. That's a good movie. It's very, very sexual. Yeah. And like Emma Stone is naked for like a big chunk of this. Um, so if you're into that, if you love Emma Stone... If you want to see your tits equal opportunity uh if you want to see some male nudity uh not a new movie but the movie bronson i don't even know if i really recommend it it's a uh, <laughs> nicholas wending reffing's first movie so the drive director's first mm. movie it's uh tom hardy as this notorious british uh, <laughs> this notorious british criminal um and whenever so whenever every once in a while he'll just start a fight with like all the guards at once and he'll like do something. He'll like take one hostage or like shank one or like do something to gr- get their attention. And then he like strips naked and covers himself in soot and just fights them. And that happens like three or four times. So if you want to see some Tom Hardy dong, I saw this prison movie recently. It's called Shot Collar. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's about this guy who he is like he went to a, his wife and like his family friends. And then they're driving home and I guess they were like, they had like a couple glasses of wine and he runs a red light and they get smashed into and his best friend dies in the back. Um, And so he ends up going to like a state penitentiary for this, Mm -hmm. even though this was his first charge ever. Mm -hmm. And it was like manslaughter. It's not like he meant to do it. And he blew just like a little bit over, I guess. And so he ends up like joining a gang in this prison and putting in work for these like this Aryan Brotherhood kind of thing. And then he becomes a shot caller. And I was like, whoa, guy, you were like a lawyer before you went in. You just went completely left. They were like, here, here's this shank. Go stab somebody. And you were like, all right, let me do that. It's not like a, a critical thinker. Like a lawyer is like a critical thinker. Yeah. You wouldn't just do that. You know? I don't know. I feel like you'd take a beating before you went and stabbed somebody. Yeah. The movie was terrible. You know, I saw this movie. It was about a... Uh a successful French chef who uh, kidnapped someone and then he had to serve hard time. And then he uh, had a friendly rat that kept <laughs> sneaking <laughs> items <laughs> into the prison before eventually he became like king shit of the prison from all the extra stuff. He oh, you're talking about Shanka Tui. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if you don't understand that reference, you need to listen to the entirety of our Ratatouille review. <laughs> Like literally the entirety of it, because I think we drop it like <laughs> the last uh, five ten minutes. All the gold, just if if you're here, remember all the gold is in the back. <laughs> yeah, literally, you got to sit through a slog <laughs> before you get to the good stuff. It's much like uh, I don't know what's a movie that's like that. Uh, it's the the wait, what is it? The Magnificent Seven. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's such a random. Rebel Moon 2 came out. Are you ever going to watch that? Fuck no. <laughs> I'm like interested. I heard she was called the scar giver because she gave the guy a scar. <laughs> if that's not writing, I don't know what is. <laughs> She's the scar giver. The one of legend. The one that's been prophesied about. She gives people scars. Speaking of scar, Lion King. Mufasa. Mufasa. Disney. New Mufasa movie coming out. Bangers after bangers. <laughs> Disney is dropping on us. Aren't you guys excited? It's a prequel to The Lion King. Not the one that you love, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the one everybody hated. <laughs> the, the 3D one. I watched that for that that one, the, the remake. Yeah. It, they, they do like the, the animals are photorealistic. It's like, why? Do, how does that help your story? It doesn't. Because there's no emotion behind any of the words that they're saying. It's just an animal with an animal, a stupid animal face, yeah, saying like fucking uh, Doctor Doolittle. Like, <laughs> like, 
And it's just this dumb fucking real life meerkat singing it. <laughs> and it just doesn't look fun. Like, come on, Disney, do better. Oh, Jesus. I hate everything. I hate every fucking one. I just want to fucking. Doctor Who's gay now. <laughs> and black. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Terrible decisions. No, I don't mind that decision, but it's like. Like I told you in the car, it's like they're setting up these people to fail. Like <laughs> you're going to go to all these nerd fandoms and wag gay and black in front of them. That's so just how to get like, you're just asking for death threats <laughs> at yeah. this point. <laughs> like literally. Get This man shanked in the streets. He's going to go to comic con and somebody's going to slice his fucking jugular. Oh my God. Ever since the little mermaid, that actress, she's like dating rappers now and everything. She went downhill after that movie. I don't know, man. Well, <sighs> What is her name? Haley Bailey? She's like a fucking... She's like an R&B singer. It, yeah. it sounds like a misprint that got sent to like <laughs> the dollar store. Like, oh, you have the Haley Bailey doll. It sounds like a fucking disease. <laughs> yeah. At Haley Bailey syndrome. <laughs> From a cartoon to live action. Oh, God. And you turn black. <laughs> are you are you an uh, anti-woke crowd, Michael? No, I just uh, think we're we're not doing it right. <laughs> There's better ways to do this, my friend. <laughs> What's like a good example? Um, I know there's one out there. I mean, what the like define going woke? I feel oftentimes <sighs> going woke is just having a multicultural no, but I cast. Mean, like, I guess one that's just in better taste that handles the the actors better and doesn't like parade them around like circus animals. Uh, well, it's different because animation, but I feel like uh, the Into the Spider Verse yeah. movies are like this is recasting and typically, I mean, Miles Morales is a black character in the comics, but Spider Man wasn't before that comic came around, and that's a relatively new thing, and it doesn't feel like it's sitting around patting itself on the back for being like woman yeah. and. <laughs> Black kid, like it's not like it, it. It's not the having the thing. It's the the self congratulations, or when you just misread the room and are like, "Gay black Doctor Who," right after everyone's been mad about the lady Doctor Who. Yeah, and I haven't watched Doctor Who in like I watched one run of Doctor Who. I'm not a Doctor Who fan, but it just feels like sometimes these decisions are made, and it's just putting everyone involved at like like You're the sacri- their, li- their lives in danger, like, like the like, sacrificial lamb, like. Yeah. Like yeah. like the Marvels, like you know, like it's just like set up for failure. Yeah, and it, I mean, on the flip side, though, people need to get the fuck over it. Too, no, where it's like minorities exist. Also, gay, bla- like gay and black. While a lot of people be mad about it, uh, the Doctor has been a very flamboyant character in many different iterations. That's what I've heard and yeah. read very differently. So for him to be a flamer is like not that far off. In fact, right. you could read a couple of, I think, his versions of like, oh, maybe he's a little. Yeah, there are, there are better things to fucking be yeah. upset about. It's not actually a thing that's wrong. I just feel bad for the people involved because yeah. they're going to get wrecked. Let's not forget that they uh, they made Jesus white. <laughs> <laughs> the original. The original Jesus they made white. The original uh, remember, racial recasting. Remember gods of Egypt? Egypt is this ancient African empire. Gerard, White people. Gerard <laughs> Butler. <laughs> Get over here. Uh, okay. Well, now. Okay. We bye. To- <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So you're the little girl in the red hood. That was quite a bit of falling you did just now. Oh, you saw that. Yeah, gravity's working. Those old cable cars on there. She read a letter. Wow, something smells good. Those, uh, goodies in there? I'm not supposed to talk to strangers. No, you shouldn't. Good call. What are you doing way out here in the big bad forest? You taking the goodies to someone in particular? Um, my granny. Granny? Granny Pocket, the goody lady? My goodness, she makes some good goodies. She's got a thing. It's like a, uh, it's like a, uh, cookies. Shortbread chocolate dicing between very... It's good. Uh, it's very good. You make deliveries to your granny often? I don't think I should tell you that. Oh, you don't have anything else in that basket. 